I want to talk a little bit this morning about a recent creation because I believe the Word of God stands eternal and we must accept it as God has given it. We must not change it. We must not tamper it. We must hold it dear. We must hang on to it with all our might because the Word of God is not our words. It's God's words, His thoughts to us, His heart being spread throughout the world, and it's what he desires for us more than anything else to cling to. And I believe the devil, for every everything God establishes, the devil has a counterfeit. Wouldn't you agree? It, it just goes throughout everything. When God does something, the devil counterfeits it. He tries to make it something it's not, and he tries to reverse the thought on it. And I hope more than anything in today's message that you would understand that we as people of God need to have faith and truth and we must trust God and his word with all our might and uh, I just I want to address this idea of a recent creation because um, we're looked at as a minority today across the world even in Christi Christianity we're looked at as kind of the dirty part of Christianity in the sense that we still believe that we this is a recent creation that you know we didn't evolve and and that, that, that this this whole thing is billions of years old uh, and many of our young people have been taught that evolution is a fact and not a theory and they have embraced uh, this idea of theistic evolution I reject it with all my heart, with all my might, because of what Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 and 1, 9 says. And that is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. God created. We have a creator. Would you say amen? And he's the one who established this. He's the one that put it in place. He's the one that created something out of nothingness. And he is the only one that can do that. And so we have to either accept that or reject that. And if we accept any part of evolution or the evolutionary theory, we have rejected the word of God. I can't say that strong enough. And I don't really, I care, but I don't really care if you hate me for it. But I believe what the word says, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The, ord, the earth was without void, meaning it had nothing. It was in chaos. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hoovering the face of the waters. God was there. God created. God established. God brought life out of chaos. And think about that in reference to your own personal life. God can bring order out of a chaotic life. Would you say amen? God is the creator. He is the recreator. And I think this is the big question of our age. I really believe this. I believe this is the question of a lifetime. Is this a recent creation or is this something that has evolved over billions of years. That's the question of our age. And I believe that it's important and that we must understand it. And God desires that we understand it. And this is the question we must answer. Did it take billions of years? Or has it been approximately 6,000 years that we've been here? What does the Bible have to say about the length of time since creation? Was it billions of years or 6,000? Ultimately, in our own hearts, in our own belief structure, in our own trust of the Word of God, we have to understand that. We have to embrace it. And the question lies in the plan of salvation. You see, if we evolved, we don't need a Redeemer. If we evolved, if we, are, if we have started from an amoeba and we are heading towards perfection, we don't need a creator or a recreator. 
Ultimately, it's about faith. It's about trust in the word of God. Do we need redemption or will we evolve to be good enough? You know, everybody has this idea if we protest enough that we're going to become good enough. Society is going to become good enough. And I believe that's a lie of Satan. As long as sin is in this world, we will never be good enough. We can work as hard as we want to work, but it'll never be perfect. And that's because we have a deceiver. And I was telling a few folks in Sabbath school this morning that, you know, in the word belief lies the word lie. And that's what Satan does. He subtly comes in and he attacks our belief structure by introducing lies like evolutionary fact. That is a subtle lie of Satan because it's actually a theory. And matter of fact, if you read The Origin of the Species written by Charles Darwin, you will come to realize that even in his own writings, he does not answer the question that defines the name of the book origin of the species. He doesn't really define that. And I believe that as people of God, we have to trust and learn from God's word and accept it. If you look in 1 Chronicles, let's turn ahead in 1 Chronicles chapter 1. Here you see laid out by God in Chronicles chapter 1, the family tree. And basically, it starts with Adam, the first. And yes, I understand that Adam is sort of a general term of humanity, but I believe, as God says it, that there was a beginning. And it started with a male, and God had created him out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into him the breath of life. And that's how he became a living being. And that's what the Word of God tells me, and that's what I accept. But you see here in First Chronicles, this, this understanding of, of the family tree and the historical part of life and humanity. And, and I could read all through this, you know, and we could get tied up in this uh, to a certain extent in the family tree. But in this, I believe, we find truth. And we find evidences that we aren't billions of years old. For God himself lays out this idea of the family tree. Have you ever, any of you ever uh, signed up for Ancestry.com? Uh, it's kind of interesting. You send in some saliva and, and they kind of map out sort of who you are, and, and it's kind of interesting to find out who you are. And the DNA has a way of uh, sort of showing you your family tree, in a sense. And, and you can uh, click on these little flowery-looking things, and it can tell you about your great-great-grandfather and wh where he was and what he was doing. I mean, it's just, just an informative way to understand this, this idea of family tree. And uh, so here you see in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, God is explaining the family tree. Now, some of you at this point might say, boring. You know, when you read through uh, the scriptures, Genesis is so power packed, full of information. And it's got all of these great stories and accounts of the patriarchs and the matriarchs and those that are walking through this journey in life. And some of these things you can really identify with and you can just really it solidifies who you are. And you think, boy, I can relate to Abraham. I can really relate to Jacob. And I, I, I just I understand Rachel and you as you're working through Genesis, you're so excited. And then you come to First Chronicles. Some would even stop at Leviticus and say, uh, boring. <laughs> but in these statements in First Chronicle lies a, a mystery and an essence that helps us with our faith. It establishes our history in our family tree. It lays out all of humanity. Even though at times we might think the begats are boring, I believe that Jesus loves you so much that he wants to answer even the plaguing questions of life, creation, 
or evolution. And, and especially for our young people who have been fed this theory as a fact, I want you to question your faith and I want you to go back to the Word of God and let it establish what you believe and why you believe it. Because in it, I believe that we find hope. After all, you know, what could be more exciting than the begats anyway? It's kind of, for us old people, it's like watching home movies. You know, be invited over to your friends and they start putting on the, the home movies. And it's like, oh boy. You know, now it's what, home videos or whatever it is today. But it's not very exciting. But I think in this you see truth and your faith is established. If you're reading through your Bible chapter by chapter, 1 Chronicles chapter 1 is usually where you nod off. Some good sleeping material. But I believe that there's a question of this. Since that this is so terribly boring, why did God put this in the Bible? And I think it was to establish our faith and to help us to realize that God loves us. So much so that He is willing to share with us the truth as it is in Jesus Christ and why humanity needs redemption. God must have thought that the sequence was important for us to know. Do you ever like it when an important person remembers your name? It's, it's somewhat of a compliment, but it's also kind of a, a self-realization that, wow, I, you know, they must care about me enough to remember my name. And, you know, I'll tell you, I, I'm awful at remembering names until I've actually sat down at the table, around a table, and worked with you. Uh, and had interaction, it's so hard, you know, especially on the run. If you meet someone for the first time, it's so difficult to remember names. I try this word association, you know, what do they look like? How can I identify word associate? Their name association with something I would remember or call attention to. And uh, when my wife worked in Florida, uh, some of the names that she would come out with from schools it was just so cute I mean they were these names I would never have a chance in a million years to remember but she could remember all of them and it's because she had interaction with them and and you know it's it's really it really is a compliment when somebody important remembers your name think about God God loves us so much that he's willing to remember our name. As big as the universes are, God remembers your individual name. God loves you that much. It's beyond comprehension to me, but God cares that much for us that he would remember our name. And you see that in the family tree in 1 Chronicles chapter 1 the family of Adam to Seth to Abraham, clear to Abraham. You know, God loves us so much that the very hairy, very hairs in your head are numbered. Isn't that a cute picture? He knows how many hairs you have. Even when you are on a pursuit to lose all your hair, he remembers exactly how many there, there are and how many numbered on top of your head. Don't you think it's important for us to know that God knows everything about us? You see, this is when faith and trust is established, when God builds that relationship with you and you come to recognize in the small answered prayers and the things that God does continuously in your life to change you and to help you to surrender your will to Him, that faith and trust is established. You know, I was thinking about Autumn this morning. You're establishing that relationship with her. And it's so important for you to include things in her life that's going to make her whole and make her a better person. And um, 
I don't think there's anything you could do and, and that enhances a relationship with God than to share with your children the love of God and the things that God would do to encourage that relationship. That is so important. Don't you think for a moment that it's not important that that relationship with God is established and caressed even more so today than ever of verse history? Isn't it important for us to have that friendship and trust in God? God looks at us, you know, we're not orphans in the heart of God. We're, our, we're His children. We're His sons. We're His daughters. And God loves us enough that He knows every intimate detail about us. He loves us so much and He cares so much about us that He longs for us to have faith and trust in Him and that we should exercise that faith and that trust and learn to establish it in Him and to be encouraged by Him. He cares about everything that you're going through. If you look in Genesis, if you turn back in Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5. You see here some more of the family tree of Adam. And if you go right down the family tree in Genesis 5, verses 6 through 11, and Genesis 5, 21, 27 through 30, you see the family tree. It starts with Adam. Adam lived 930 years. And then it goes to Seth. And Seth lived 912 years. And Enos down to 905 years, and Canaan down to 910 years. And it goes right down the family tree. And, and it goes all the way down to Abraham. And it, and it tells of the time and how many years they lived in their life. Can we keep a running total of earth's history and humanity from this chart that God gives in His Word? As we see the start with Adam and it goes right down and he even gives the years that they lived on earth. And it even goes down even to the point of the flood. You'll see in this chart right there where it comes to Noah and the flood. So we know from Adam to the flood, we know exactly God maps it out generation by generation. How accurate does this seem to be? In the Word of God, it seems extremely precise, doesn't it? Do you think there's a reason that God establishes the family tree and He goes through the Word of God and He gives us the evidences of the time periods starting with the very first created human being? It's as though God is giving us a love message not only does it give the age of the father, but it also when his son was born, and then it gives the age of the father. This chronology in First Chronicles chapter 1 brings us from Abraham to King David and the tribes in the promised land. So here you see in the word of God in First Chronicles that it, takes, it starts with Adam and it goes all the way through down to King David. God is mapping out history. He's giving an, an identification mark that tells us that your faith and trust in me is sure. And I'm going to show you in the word through these begats exactly how much time there is in earth's history. And then you don't have to believe a lie, but you can believe the truth. And so if you have embraced any part of the evolutionary theory, I would challenge you to go to the Word of God and prove out evolution because it goes contrary to the Word of God. Because God is very precise in His, in His reckoning of time in generations, and He gives it to us in a way that is complementary to, complimentary to the gift of salvation in Christ. 
Not only does he take us to David, but he takes us from David down to the Messiah. And you see that, well, you can't really see that in this chart, but this is sort of the genealogy of Jesus. It starts with Adam, and then he kind of goes across and down, and then he comes down to King David that I was telling you about, 14, 14 generations between um, I'll have to turn around to read it because I can't read it from here. 14 generations from Abraham to David. 14 generations from David until the captivity in Babylon. 14 generations from the captivity in Babylon until the Messiah. And there you see coming from the line of David, Solomon and Nathan, which is Mary and Joseph lineage all the way down to Christ in his birth. And we know that the Jews from the time of Christ forward up until currently today, they have mapped out history. They have written diligent records exactly the time periods. And you even see in Scripture how it predicts the dark ages in Daniel and Revelation. And the, historically, the time periods are precise and accurate from Adam all the way down until today's history. We have exact figures and times and God gives them to us to raise our faith and trust in Him. I believe it is possible from the Bible to calculate from Adam, not only to King David, but all the way down to the Messiah and even up until today. If you diligently study the Word of God, from King David to the Messiah, Jesus, from Jesus, and from Jesus to today. Jesus gives us the generations. He establishes our trust and faith in the Word of God. And we can put our trust in the Word of God. We don't have to believe a lie. But we can trust in what Jesus has preserved for us throughout the centuries. Yes, it takes, and you know, I've been in classes and I understand a little bit about geology and I, I, I understand that uh, it takes just as much faith to embrace the creation as it does the evolutionary theory. But I believe that the Word of God takes us to the right, that it takes us to the truth, and that we can embrace this fact based upon the Word of God. You know, it takes faith to believe both, but I believe that God has mapped out the generations for our enhancement, for our faith-building trust in Him. And so we don't have to believe a lie. We can believe the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus records the generation from Adam to King David to the Messiah, even up until the current day. He does it so we will trust Him. So we will trust in His Word. If you wonder where this genealogy is for Jesus, just look in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, and Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Luke gives us the genealogy as it starts clear back to Adam because he was a Gentile. He was a physician and a Gentile. So he wanted to take the lineage back to Adam. <laughs> and Matthew, who is a good Jew, takes it back to Father Abraham. And he maxes it. He, he makes the generations from Abraham forward. But still, it's fantastic uh, uh, markers for our enhancement and our trust and our faith in the Word of God. You know when someone calls you a fundamentalist because you believe what God has written, don't be offended. Look at it as a compliment. I mean, I don't like the word fundamentalist because it associates with uh, a lot of bad things. But if we fundamentally believe the word of God, that's a compliment to me. If we actually believe that God has the power to create 
from nothingness in six literal days, in, in six 24-hour periods. That's, not, that's, a, that's, that's a compliment to me if you call me a fundamentalist. Because I do believe that God has the power and the ability because he recreated me in a second. He changed my heart in a moment. God has the power to do these things because they're beyond us. We lack faith and trust in believing. But you you have to understand that in all of this, Jesus loves us. He wants us to trust in Him. But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is a statement that's always plagued me. <laughs> as I was rebelling against God, as, I was, as my life was in chaos, as my life was out of order, in the worst possible parts of my life, that's when I felt Christ's presence even closer yet. He was working in my life to change my life forever. And when I was furthest from Him, I felt His presence the most. Maybe, perhaps you feel that way. Maybe you feel distant from Christ today. Look for His presence in your life. Look for His presence in your current situation. Yes, you may have doubt. Yes, you may have fear. Yes, you may be afraid of the things that may turn around and bite you, but that's okay. Christ desires to have that relationship with you today. He can change things forever. You see... In God's Word, He makes provision so we don't need to guess anymore. We don't have to believe a theory. We can trust the Word of God, which is a fact. If you wonder about a recent creation, I would challenge you to go back to the Word of God. Trust what He says. Because it's all right there in First Chronicles and in Genesis chapter 5. It's all right there. And God desires that you would embrace the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In Jesus' name, I pray that you would trust and have faith in Him. Dear kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life for salvation in your son, Jesus. Lord, go with us today. Strengthen our faith. Encourage us along this journey of life. Lord, I just want to pray a special prayer for Ashley this morning. Draw close to her. Let her know that you're the God of all comfort. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. Go with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.